computer. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Back to Basics um, uh, event this morning. And I'm guessing everybody's here because you are either creating courses or would like to know how to create courses. Um, and uh, for those who know me, I'm Beverly Poole and I'm the founder of Aspire for Business Academy. Um, the Academy has uh, produced over 300 training courses in the matter of 20 months with um, some 1200 enrollments from which I think 30% are actual purchases, which means that our turnaround from um, enrollments to purchase is actually quite high when the average um, sale is usually two or four percent. So we're really happy with the way that Academy is growing in that 20 months that we've actually been marketing. Um, Nikki is going to talk to us about creating courses as our course uh, main course creator. Um, and uh, what I'll do at the end of Nikki's presentation is to come back and to talk you through the brand ambassador handbook, which I've uh, put together, uh, which enables me to uh, talk and help people through 20 different ways of marketing your course. Uh, because, of course, we are predominantly a hosting platform, although we do have a, a cycle of marketing. So in, in January of 2020, that's when our full programme will start. Um, and in the first quarter, uh, we've also got our second round of paid ads, which is going through Google. Um, we're on a three month rolling programme with that as well at the moment. Um, and I will come back and just uh, talk a little bit more about that at the end. So uh, just all very exciting and uh, very excited to have everybody on board as well. So thank you for joining us. Um, and um, I'm going to pass over to Nikki, uh, who's going to talk us through uh, Back to Basics and um, how you get your courses online. Thank you, Nikki. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm just going to do is share my... Bear with me a second. I thought I hadn't shared it and then I shared it and then I hadn't. <laughs> Oh, it's all good fun, isn't it? Right, hold on one second. It's all here, all ready to go. So most of you actually know me already from the Aspire for Business um, Academy, which is great, but we uh, this is an open session. So we are um, recording for those who did originally sign up, even if they're not here right now. And so what you will find is that for those of you who are already part of the Academy, you might recognize some of this stuff from the course creators tutorial. Um, but the idea is, is that as, as I run through, we're really informal uh, this morning. So if something crops up and you've got a question, don't feel like you need to hang on to it until the end. OK, J just shout out because I'd much rather us have that conversation um, wh while we're talking about it rather than leaving it till the end and then maybe not having time to, to actually go through it. So all good. G give me a thumbs up if we're, we're all set to go. Brilliant stuff. All right. So let's crack on then now that I've actually got my stuff up here. So the, the six steps that I actually wanted to go through were these. So I'm going to talk about validating your your course idea and just a couple of tips of how to do that and why it's so important that you do. We're going to talk about designing for online learners uh, and why that's different. So, so many of you might have done face-to-face -face, um, training or hosting of some sorts, but there's a slight difference between that and um, designing for your online learners. We'll talk about equipment as well, right the way from basic, uh, which works fine through to professional and the, the differences in between. We'll talk about how to actually create. So I've got a couple of hints and tips for you about recording uh, and editing your online courses. And then we've got hosting. So we'll be talking a little bit here about Aspire for Business Academy and the fact that we host and how we can do that and marketing. So when we get to sections five and six, that's um, predominantly when I'm going to be handing back over to Beverly to kind of um, really highlight the uh, what, what we've got going on for us within the academy but before i do that um what i wanted to find out from you guys is where you currently are on your journey so uh i'm going to show you five images and then just unmute yourself and just let me know where you currently are but, but let me show you the five first so this is all to do with where you currently are 
on your online course creation journey. So this is number one. So number one is you're just peering over the parapet. So you haven't recorded anything yet. You're, you're interested in it, but you're really just kind of wanting to see how it all works. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is you're over the parapet. <laughs> You've had a look and it all just looks a little bit overwhelming. Um, and you're not quite sure where to go through. So then number three is you've started, but you're frustrated by either how long it's taking or by the technology. Uh, number four is I'm, I'm pretty happy with things. I'm just here to kind of get a few hints and tips. And number five is being there, done that and feeling rather smug about it. <laughs> Okay, so just unmute yourselves um, for me, guys, and, and just tell me, where do you think you currently are? Between a two and a three. Okay, so you, you've started already. Yeah. Um, is, is there any overwhelm or frustration there for you, Sandy? And if so, what is it? it it's the same as I was talking to you about before. It's got to that point where I've got all the ideas. I've finally got the ideas down on paper. Um, but now it's kind of like making that leap into creating something that people are going to want to learn from. Fantastic. OK. All right. Thanks for that. Brilliant stuff. Who else? Um, so, Nikki, um, you and I have had this conversation, right, very briefly, that because of the nature of my course that, that might evoke various different emotions, my priority is obviously running a live facilitation. So I'm not entirely sure if this whole hour is going to add value to me, but I'm happy to hang on if you say, no, 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 just, uh, you know, stay because I don't know a lot about marketing. So obviously I am marketing my program right now. However, having said that, um, I did initially meet you on the intention of starting this online course, right? And if I'm honest with you, I wish you were next door to me because I would be happy to pay you and sort out all the technology and then say, right, sit and now record. So <laughs> as you can see, I get very frustrated with the technology and also I get quite overwhelmed and then I give up and I'm like, you know what, this is just too much. I'd rather do. So, yes, you know, am I interested in online? Possibly, but I still believe that with the content of my program, it, it really needs sort of hand holding. It's not one of those that go and do it yourself. So that's where I am at the moment. Thank you for that. Um, in, in terms of what we're covering this hour, almost everything that we talk about here can be translated into doing it live online. So, um, and, and the, we'll, we'll be talking about technology and stuff as well. But if, again, if there's specific questions, Chris, that, that come up, just shout. Okay. I'm just, Brilliant. It needs to be like idiot proof and probably need to drum it in my head about 10 million times before I really understand it. I'm terrible, really terrible. But the good news is I've got a really nice camera that was recommended by you and uh, I look a little bit more decent. So I think that's one step in the right direction. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, Renford, Olivia, we're about to see you. Um, Am I on mute? Hold on. No, no, I can hear you, Olivia. Um, well, I, I guess I'm number one, but uh, so, so my situation is um, I personally, I don't actually want to create an online course. What I want is I want to create an online academy part of my brand. Okay. Part of the magazine brand. So I'm just here to really learn because if I'm going to move my business forward towards an online academy, I yeah. need to learn a little bit more about what online courses mean. So I'm, I'm here to, to learn so I can understand what I can propose later. Fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you, Olivia. And Renford, what about yourself? Uh, I've had tremendous ideas and written them down. I just haven't got around to it because I've been focusing on social media. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 uh, it'll give you a double thumbs up as, as well like uh, 15. it's just that um i'll be honest with you yeah i can do this uh it's not an issue for me yeah. i have the equipment you know because we've had some good chats yeah. um but it, it's time and i've been so absorbed and getting out there um so they, they know who what i stand for or what i am and everything i have been diverted so I'm going to put my hand up. Guilty as charged, and um, and uh, and uh, obviously I'll get down to something uh, ASAP now um, because I've got to transfer the ideas into something solid. 
Yeah. yeah, but uh, actually doing what you're doing there, Renford, and, and building up brand awareness of who you are and what you're doing is actually a big part of this anyway, because if you suddenly launch a course and nobody's heard of you or what it is that you're doing or your topic, you're very unlikely to sell anything because you need to build that no like trust uh, that people talk about within marketing. Um, so they need to know you, they need to like you, they need to trust you, and then they will, they will buy from you. So yeah, it's um, everything you're doing is all building towards that. Fantastic. Beverly, do you want to say anything before I um, I move on to the next bit? Um, uh, really, it was it, it's just the whole um, mentoring piece, really. I'm very happy to, to jump on and to sort of talk to anybody about, you know, how they might put their own programmes together. And it's like with Krish and, uh, you know, uh, we can put the interactive part into your programme um with zoom calls offering people one-to-one -one if they want it but sometimes people certainly with the topic that you've got and that resilience piece like to have a think about it and then talk um, and it might be that you offer that as a one-to-one -one or, or through a um a talking group um on facebook or something like that that's always a good way to go as well or a membership online we can fix that too yeah no i think i'm on the right track whenever i hear an expert like you i think oh yeah you know what i've thought about that i've got it already and but i think you know beverly i would love for you to come to a master class whenever it's convenient yeah we'll do be exactly what i'm doing and then if you mm. can offer any expertise and any guidance i would welcome that yes so my first jump into uh, interactive was about 1992 um and i wrote a, a paper which was called the um uh, the case for for interactive technology in business um, and sort of all those years later, I don't even want to say how many, <laughs> sort of all coming to fruition with, um, you know, sort of getting everybody else online, which is just the way to go. But I'll talk to you about, um, I'll talk to you about that uh, at the end when Nikki's finished with her presentation. Just got somebody else that's just joined us. So just saying hello. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'll, I'll crack on yeah. um, with them and then they can join in with us. Brilliant stuff. Thank you for that. Okay, so um, what I wanted to do was I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about myself. So uh, although some of you know me, um, again, because we're recording this and it's an open session, I just want to <laughs> it's a, why on earth listen to anything that I've got to say, basically, is what this title should be uh, on here. So my background, this is me. Um, hopefully you can see that uh, in the far right hand mm -hmm. corner there. Um, th that was me. I, I started off doing radio presenting when I was very young, thoroughly enjoyed it um, and found that I had a bit of a, a knack just for talking um, <laughs> you know, and, and engaging um, with people and asking lots of nosy questions. Um, so th for me, that, that kind of really started me off on understanding technology more than anything but also understanding with interacting with people and, and how to work with them um so i did that for a little while but i was also working at b and q as well so th this is also me far left hand side uh making random stuff for kids clubs out of bin liners and cardboard um and although the, the title of trainer wasn't part of what i did i worked on the decorative section i just happened to help out doing all these different things um again it for, for me that it enabled me to stand up in front of people and, and talk uh, unscripted. Uh, again, this is a and q I became an interior designer uh, with them and recognized, does anybody remember paint effects? Like rag rolling on the walls and crackle glazing, anything made of wood, yeah. So that came out and nobody knew how to use it. So I got volunteered by my manager to, to do some demonstrations. And I got, I think it bored of doing one-to-ones, but I certainly thought there must be a better way of doing this than every single time one person comes to me, I could do it. So I, I set up what I now know is a workshop. At the time, it was just a way of getting everybody together so that I could demonstrate everything. So th this was the cafe at Hedge End, if anybody knows it, uh, the B&Q there. And, um, and, and I started running programs as an interior designer. That then sparked off a whole career for me within being q as a trainer. I was an induction trainer, a management development trainer, and I left them as the regional training manager. Um, from there, I've done lots of different other types of learning and development roles. And that image there is now what I do. So for the last six years, I've run my own company as Curious Lighthouse and been working with the lovely Beverly for nearly two years, maybe. 
something along that line. Um, so th that that's basically my background. It, yeah, the last 20 odd years has all been about training, learning and development, and certainly for the last six years has been online as well as face to face. So these are, are my little rosettes of achievements, if you like, all these different things um, on here. I'm qualified in terms of how the, the way that I like to see this is with, with other people, when they talk about online course creation, they will predominantly talk about from the perspective of the individual who is creating the course, which is important because that's you. But ultimately, you will only sell the course if it's relevant to your learner. And I always look at things from the learner's perspective. OK, so that's where I that, that's my slant on things. All right. So enough about me. Let's crack on then. So the very first thing that I want to talk about was why create an online course. The first thing is about extending your audience reach. So some people create courses um, that are literally to uh, widen their world, to be able to interact with more. We, we've certainly recognized that in, in the last couple of years, we can do way more stuff online than, than, than we ever could, which means that we've got access to an awful lot more people around the world. So extending our audience reaches is just one of the reasons creating online courses. But we can also make money out of that as well. And depending on your topic and your audience will depend on how much that is. I get asked a lot about the pricing of courses and it's not just, you know, some kind of algebraic equation that you can do A plus B equals C and you've, and you've got your, uh, your, your price. It's a bit more tricky than that. But um, depending on how you do this, you can increase your revenue and it can be consistent, but it's not without hard work. Uh, I, I quite often see people talking about passive income. And unless you've got a big team of people behind you um, really pushing this stuff and you've got lots of uh, funnels in place, I, I don't actually believe there's any such thing as, as passive income. Um, but I'll get off my soapbox and <laughs> we'll carry on. Um, you can also add value to your clients as well. So many of us might be... Uh, creating online courses for a, a specific topic, but also you may have corporate clients or one-to-one uh, -one clients, anything like that. I've won contracts before. I, I predominantly do corporate work, management development work, um, and where I've put forward a proposal, nine times out of 10, I include something that involves an online experience. So... And that might be a pre-course for people to do before we actually join the program. It could be recordings that they watch throughout the program. It could be something that's done at the end. But um, the, the feedback that I've got is it really does add value and that's, that wins me business. And then the other reason is it creates a really good shop window. So all of the courses that, that I've created over the last few years are on my website. And so if somebody comes along and they're thinking, Nikki Forster, who's this Nikki Forster? Um, and they go and they can see all this stuff. It adds credibility to the fact that I know what I'm talking about. I've got some free courses on there for people to be able to see. And they can see the kind of topics that I'm talking about as well. So it, it expands um, your, your brand. Um, any queries or questions uh, around that at all? I will take your silence as a no and move on. <laughs> if you don't want to ask anything out loud um, or you feel it's, it's going to disrupt the flow, feel free to pop something in the chat and I will come back and have a look at that uh, a little later too. Okay. So validating your online course idea. Um, when I first started doing my online courses uh, many years ago, I kept he hearing people talk about this validating your online course idea and that they would talk about um, kind of do all this research with your audience and making sure that you, know, you were creating something that they wanted. But there's a, there's a bit of a hiccup with that in as much as I didn't have access to that audience. Um, so the way that I tend to, to do this, uh, both then and right the way through now that I find works the best for me is to use social media. And I can give you just one, one hint 
um, for, for doing it, which is whatever your topic is, is to start talking about it on social media, but ask questions. So I tend to, if I've got an idea in my mind, I'm thinking of something, I will post something that goes along the lines of, I'm thinking of doing an on, uh, creating an online course about dot, dot, dot. It might include dot, dot, dot. And then you can just ask, um, what, what's missing from this? Or, or um, do you think this might be of interest to people? Or who do you think the audience is? So you're asking people for their input rather than would you be interested? Because people don't really want to type that they'll be interested because then they think you're going to end up on some kind of marketing, you know, database where you're going to sell to them. But just genuinely, genuinely asking questions about it, seeing the types of people who respond. And if people are interested, they will tell you in the comments. OK, so that, that's just one thing that I tend to do. But if you do have access to your audience already, then this is really important because just because you've got a great idea doesn't mean to say it's going to sell. I learned that the hard way with the very first program that, that I put together, which was this whole thing about getting into training, becoming a corporate trainer, because that was my passion. Um, it was something that I'd done a lot of in the corporate world with you know, bringing up new trainers and stuff like this. And then I kind of stopped halfway through uh, developing that program and realized that actually to make any money out of this, it needed to change because people who want to change career spokes um, aren't necessarily going to have the expendable income to do that. So particularly at a lower level trainer level. So it's it was, I needed to really break that down. Instead of being a program where I was going to charge, you know, three, 400 quid for it, I needed to really break that down into small sections um, that people could purchase for much smaller, uh, smaller rents. So validating, of course, is really important. Okay. So designing for online learning. So I have kind of five steps that I um, that I always talk to people uh, about when it comes to designing. So the very first thing is what is the purpose of the course? So we're not even talking about learning yet. We're talking about why are you creating the course itself? So do you remember at the beginning I said about it could be for your shop window. So it could just be about brand awareness. Um, it could be about... Uh, getting people to the first level of something. It could be about spreading knowledge it, or it could be about making money. So you really need to understand what you're creating that course for. Because if it's to make money, there's, there's uh, ideally you'd need smaller courses or, or webinars or something in place to lead up to that purchase. If you're doing it for brand awareness, you can just do it, get it out there. OK, so what is, what is the purpose? Why are you actually creating the course? Then you can start off designing it with that, that in mind. But this now starts to talk about the learner. So start with the end in mind um, is about when your learner has finished your online course, what is it that they now have that they didn't have before? So if you put that into a statement or a sentence, that it then becomes your goal for designing. The, the third one here is about designing for your learners, not for you. And what I mean by this is if you're the type of person that um, when you need to know something, if YouTube is your first port, port, port of call, you know, how do you on YouTube and you bring it up and you watch a video, you are probably going to be more inclined to want to have videos in your uh, course content. If you are the type of person that would head to Wikipedia or Quora or somewhere like that, where it's much more text based, you might be more inclined to have more written words within your courses. But just because that's your preference doesn't mean to say that it is going to be your learner's preference. So, again, there's a little bit of research to do within that. But ultimately, I, I always think of it as, um, as a balancing scale. More people will purchase courses when there's videos in them. So that, that will get you a higher turnover. Um, but there also needs to be a little bit of a balance as well because the some people will want to be able to download worksheets or information. Um, it's fine to watch a video, but how am I going to capture that afterwards? Yeah. Okay. So the, the next one here is what challenge challenges will they overcome? So just like that, starting with the end in mind, um, in terms of the 
the end result, what challenges will they overcome is basically your your headers, your your chapter headings, um, enable them to see that there's a journey to what it is that you you're going to share with them. And that by going through that journey, they can overcome specific challenges uh, in order to get there. So we're now starting to kind of um, fill out. I'm doing this mime <laughs> a lot. I almost think of it like a book. It's like chapters within within a book. And within those chapters, you've got headings. And within those uh, chapters themselves, you've got paragraphs, which lead to other things. So that, that that's how I always uh, see this, uh, which links us into that, that last one there, which is how, how can the course be segmented? So really thinking about drilling down into bite-sized sections that um, most people will write a course so that it runs sequentially. So you need to do A before you do B before you do C, but you cannot, well, you can guarantee that in a course because you can set that up in the background so that everything is a prerequisite to, to the next one, but that's not how people prefer to learn. They will scan through things they might go through it sequentially, but they like to have the option of seeing um, that there might be a, a different chapter that they want to go to first, and then they, they might come back to it. So always have that in mind is that the, the, you've got kind of almost mini sections within a larger course. Does that make sense? I'm getting nods, so that's good. <laughs> okay, all right. So let's move on to equipment um and a few software essentials so things to consider so all these things you can consider whether you are pre-recording or doing live so um or, or you're doing a hybrid of both which i've done uh before as well so the first thing is people will view and listen to your courses on different devices so I'm currently in front of my PC, but I do work on my laptop. Um, I downloaded a piano course the other day because I'm trying to relearn how to play the piano. Um, and that, that's on quite a small screen, that one. So all of these things, they need to look good, but they need to sound good as well. And your speakers on your laptop will sound different to when you put headphones in and you listen back. So you need the best quality that you can get of, of um, when it comes to equipment. Um, what I would say is only decide on your equipment once you've designed your course. Don't get too carried away with thinking that you need a whole raft of stuff before you've designed everything. Because if you're designing and you're only going to do voiceover visuals, so something like voiceover PowerPoint, what you really need is you need PowerPoint, obviously, but you need a really good microphone. You don't necessarily need a camera. Whereas if you're going to do face to camera, you're going to need lighting and camera. And we're going to talk about all of that thing, all of those in, in a moment so I can share some ideas with you. So only actually buy this stuff once you've decided how you're going to deliver your content. And you don't have to spend a fortune, but you do need good quality. So let's have a look at a couple of uh, different setups. Um, before I share with you, I've got three setups before, before I share. So I'm laughing because I know it's coming next. Uh, before I share um, those of you, I wanted to share just a couple of images of me when I first started through to what my equipment looks like now. So this was my setup when I recorded my very first course. Uh, yes, that is an ironing board. Uh, yes, those are board games uh, with my laptop on top of it. I've got my microphone there. I set it up there because I had the window. So I was trying to get the natural light. Um, however, I wasn't, you can see that there's a pillow on top of a chair, which has got a dog blanket on it because I was trying to be high enough because I've only got short legs. So the back, it was just, it's like a whole logistical nightmare of, of stuff. And I was so uncomfortable recording it. I didn't look relaxed at all. So then I moved on to uh to having a tripod just with my smartphone and i've got a little lavalier mic i'm still in front of my window there so no no other lighting at uh, this point um and that's fine but the, the fact that um i live in the uk and the the lighting here the natural lighting can change by the second uh it can be raining one minute and sunny the next it doesn't add for consistency uh, of things so what I have now this is pretty much what I'm sat in front of right now so I sat I've got a big screen I've got a flat light um, which you can see at the top there I've got um, a good 
uh, Logitech web webcam, and I've got a, a really good microphone as well. And this is this is what I record on now. But I think everybody kind of goes through that cycle of um, you know getting something and maybe working out does it work, does it not work. So my suggestions for a minimal setup, and this all works fine, by the way. It's just does it work fine for you with the content that you want to do? So if you're doing face to camera work, you're going to need something that you can record your face on. So generally speaking, a smartphone is fine. Um, what you'll also need is a lavalier mic. So I use a Rode smartphone lavalier mic and that's really good quality. In fact, it's, it's been better quality than some of the other microphones that, that I've had. And also just a little clip on like a little ring light holder and I can actually put my phone in that. Um, all of that together is about 60 quid because I'm not including the price of the phone in there, obviously. I think most of us have a phone, so I'm, I'm not including that. The road mic's about 50, and, and that little light there from Amazon is, is about 10 quid. That's all you really need for a minimal setup if you're just going to be recording face to camera. The, the second setup for me is what I call a good enough setup. So this is slightly more um, professional and slightly more in situ. So uh, whereas the... the um, the, the other one you can kind of move around with. So this is the uh, one of the cameras uh, that I would recommend. And it's got a little inbuilt light in any way. Um, it's got some really good reviews uh, on this one. The microphone that I started off using was called a, 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 it's a Blue Snowball. Um, the Blue, uh, sorry, the Yeti is another one that you may have heard of. And they're, they're good quality uh, ones and probably about 50, 60 quid, depending on where you get it from. And like I say, the, the light that I use is, is a panel light rather than a ring light. Now, the reason why I don't use a, a, a ring light, and especially a big one, is it makes my eyes look tiny, the pupils. I, I just look like a, something out of a scary movie. So I, I don't use those. Um, and I do tend to find that if you've got glasses as well, the reflection from a ring light can, it, it's a bit more glarish, whereas a flat light tends to be uh, flatter. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the, this particular one, most of them come with dimmable switches so that you can have it as a bright light or a more um, a soft glow with it. But wherever you're recording, you will need some kind of light to, to light your face. Um, so that it's you're not in the shadows. So all of that together is about 130 pounds. Again, depending on where you buy, um, I've just got prices off of Amazon because it's the easiest place just to go and have a look and see what's around. Okay. Um, if you really want to get professional about it, then this is the setup that I currently have. So I use a Logitech C922 Pro Stream webcam. It's not easy to say all in, in one breath. Um, it's a streaming. Uh, as it says there, it's a streaming webcam. So it's, it's meant for live uh, recordings. It will zoom in and out automatically when it needs to. Uh, just a little hint or tip. Somebody, um, I, I, was, I was mentoring somebody regarding course creation and they said, I've, I bought what I thought was a really good camera, but it's really not taking uh, great images. So we, we went on a Zoom call and we had a little look and I said, well, what is it? And I couldn't understand why it wasn't doing what it was meant to do and then I just realized it was dirty it needed to be it needed to be wiped um so so do do that because we tend to readjust you know where, where it is on the screen and, and, and move it around so just make sure every now and again you give it a good wipe uh and that, that might just solve everything um this is the the microphone that I'm using now interestingly enough if you are recording on zoom the microphone that you have might not matter so much because Zoom is a streaming, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a conference um, tool. So it downgrades the quality of the audio because of the bandwidth. So right now the recording that people might hear post event won't necessarily pick up the excellent quality of my microphone because it's recorded on Zoom. So I always record my audio separately for my courses using a piece of software called Audacity. And then I, I marry that together with the images and it gives a crystal clear um, audio. 
and I need an adjustable um, arm for it as well. So this, I don't know whether you can see that, oh, is my arm that I use. I just pulled it out of the end. There we go. Uh, so, so that can go anywhere. And when I don't need it, it's just it's just out of the way. And I use exactly the same light. Uh, again, so, so this is my setup. So we're more expensive now, 360 quid, but I don't intend on buying anything else for a very, very long time. Uh, so, so this is me done. Okay. Um, just in terms of software and, and things like that, I've mentioned about Zoom that you can use there are other things that you can use to record as well zoom has a great function on it to be able to um what's it called i can't remember what it's called now but it, it basically helps to make you look a bit more consistent and smoother uh and not so blotchy and things like that so, so that, that's quite good um and it's also free uh, as well you can record directly onto camera with uh, with most laptops or PCs and things like that. I but I would always, always, always recommend you use external equipment to record. So not your laptop's webcam, not your laptop's microphone. External is is so much clearer and always have some form of lighting. Any queries or questions about um, the kind of the, the equipment? or technology before I move on to a few hints and tips about actually recording. There's a few notes which Chris has put in there. She says she loves your honesty. Oh, <laughs> Thank <well>. you. <laughs> Always honest, aren't we? And uh, can you provide the links to the mic? I think they're actually under the words there, actually, aren't they? But so we can do that. Um, and um, yes, I think I like the filters on Zoom. It makes me look about 20 years younger. Um, and uh, the other thing I was going to say was about subtitles, Nikki. Uh, you know, in our diverse world and also for people that have got um, uh, different, uh, you know, speak different languages. So it's quite handy to have that up as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, subtitles, I do all my subtitles via YouTube. Yeah. Uh, it, it's um, so I've got a YouTube channel that, that I've set up. It has actually got videos on it, but I don't want all my course videos on there. So I, I upload them and just select it to be private. And then what it does, and this is within the Course Creators Academy tutorial, you, you will see there is a section in there that talks about uh, subtitles, but basically it will auto translate for you. And then you just go in and you make sure that it's actually the, the correct thing. I talk quite quickly <clears throat> and it doesn't always pick up on things. Uh, so I have to go in and correct quite a few bits and pieces. But yes, uh, subtitles are, um, are a very good thing to have and if you are uh, when you're creating things if you sorry if you're going to use visuals like slides whether that be through powerpoint or canva or something like that always remember if you're going to use subtitles as well that section at the bottom is going to have wording over it so don't have anything there for too long that's going to be blurred out by by the text so i would try and shuffle things up okay Wonderful. All right. Um, so just a few tips for actually recording in terms of face to camera. But there, are, like I said, there are so many different options for recording. You can record voice over visuals. You can you can record yourself. You can do interview style. Um, you could you in, in the courses we've got, you can just have audio as well. So it's almost like a podcast so that there are so many different things. But just in terms of a few tips. Um, if you're going to be recording, like, like we hire here, think about your, your background. Olivia, I love your background. That is, that is just beautifully made for, for recording face to camera stuff. <laughs> um, my, my background here, this is actually our office stroke spare bedroom. Um, the, the little thing behind there has got a bed that folds down and we just kind of fashioned it together because I didn't want a bed in the background. But you can, you can do this wherever but do be conscious about what you have in the background and it's it's small things so things like has somebody left a cardigan on the side can you see, i'm not even going to point the camera over in that corner because that's where all the rubbish is um that we haven't sorted out in this bedroom you know so is it slightly out of the way the the, the other thing is i've got a window next to me here if I have the curtain fully open, can you see now I've got this kind of glare 
here. Whereas if I just pull it slightly to that glare now goes. So just think about all of this thing. How does it look? And just start recording yourself and looking back at it with a critical eye and thinking, right, okay, if I just change that and that, then it should be fine. Uh, my suggestion would always be to record landscape rather than portrait. Portrait is very popular for mobile phones, but landscape is much more acceptable for online courses because people tend to watch mainly on laptops, tablets or PC. Um, they might watch on, on mobiles, but usually they're, they're watching more on those more substantial ones where it will lend itself to being recorded in landscape. Eye contact. <laughs> um, eye contact's a really interesting one. You, I tend to put a little sticker. If I'm using my phone, I, don't, I haven't got it here actually. If I'm using my phone, it's got a little uh, sticker where the webcam is on the phone because of course it's not in the middle, it's off to the side. So when you're doing webinars, it's quite tricky because I want to look at you guys and you're all over here, which means my eye contact's way off to the side. Um, if I had me up on the screen, I might want to look at me because, you know, you're kind of checking out, is my hair okay? Have I got spinach in my teeth? <laughs> that kind of stuff. But ultimately, you're talking to the individual that's at the other end of the camera, and therefore that's where you should be looking. So just popping a little sticker or a post a note or something next to it tends to work well. Smile before you press record. Um, I don't edit heavily when I'm recording things. I tend to what I call bookend. So I will clip off the beginning and I will clip off the end. Anything else that happens in between just happens. Even if I go off on a random tangent, which I quite often do, as you can probably <laughs> tell by the way that I'm talking to you guys now. But that, that's my personality. That that's um, I, I feel if somebody is buying a course from me, then that's what they're buying. Uh, so I, that, that's my style. So I tend to bookend. But if I smile before I press record and breathe in as well, then it means there's a lot less more editing to do. So if you think, right, I'm going to do a live demonstration <laughs> for you now. So let, let, let's imagine I'm pressing record up here. So if I press record and then go, then the, the whole kind of breathing it, <laughs> I can see Chris laughing at me now. Uh, the whole kind of breathing in and smiling, it seems much more false. Whereas if I smile and take my breath in and then press record, it's just there. Always smile at the end as well. People forget to smile at the end. They're, they're kind of busy concentrating on what they're doing and thinking, right, I need to, I need to stop recording. So the eyes go down, they, they press record. But if you're smiling, just hold it for maybe two or three seconds and then get your eyes down and, and you know, press stop recording. It makes it a really nice end shot and people feel more warmed to you. OK, um, and the, the last tip that, that I've got really about recording is keep it short. So I've put less than three minutes is ideal. That's quite tricky to do. So I would say kind of three to six minutes per section. If you've got a, a large section that you can break down even better. But because you are not physically in the room with somebody, they will get distracted. Like right now, I've been talking for a good 30 odd minutes, which means in that time, um, I suspect, and this is all fine, by the way, some of you may have had a thought about something and made a note. Some of you may have been on your phone answering a text message, um, you know, all kinds of things, because to ask somebody for their sole attention for that amount of time is nigh on impossible. So the shorter, the, the better. Webinars, you can get away with it. Uh, but in terms of creating content for people to be able to really take in what you want them to, having it short allows them to digest that and then gives them the choice as to do I move on to the next section, in which case I'm taking more ownership for moving forward, or do I want to pause it there and nip to the loo or go and get a cup of coffee or leave it till next week? Yeah, so short, short and sweet. Oh, I had another one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and spacing I, this because I've already talked about this leave a space between pressing record and talking so I talked about that when I was talking about the smiling all right so just um a, a couple more things um in terms of hosting I'm actually just going to park that for a second and Beverly I'll come back to that in a moment when I hand back over to you 
because hosting is really important to understand what you're getting within that. And I'm just going to talk very quickly about organic marketing again before I hand over to Beverly um, to talk about that, that as an option as well. So for me, organic marketing, I've just got four tips to, to share with you. So one is sharing the behind the scenes stuff is really important. So if you are creating content, then think about posting about creating the content, not just about the course. So I quite often, you know, take photographs of me just recording or if something goes wrong, I, you know, I tell people about it. So the behind the scenes stuff really helps to engage people. Um, think about having a launch week so if something is coming up really kind of build to it and this isn't just about sell 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 it's about i'm really excited that there's only seven days to go until we're going to be launching this so it becomes much more personal so webinars that link to your courses these could be your own webinars but also you could piggyback on other people's webinars become guest speakers um there are also, I haven't put it in here, but local radio stations that, that really uh, look for business owners to talk about this stuff. So that, that could be something. And they usually record it as well and give you the recording so you can make bite-sized sessions um, out of it. But all of this is about the personal approach. Uh, so if you're looking at organic marketing, it's all about the, the no like trust that I talked about before. Do they know you? Do they know enough about you? Do they like you? Uh, do they trust you to provide what you say you're going to provide? So that might be a small taster of what you've got in your courses, or it could be, like I say, um, an interview that you've done. But for to get people to part with their money, they need to know that you are going to deliver. So having something for them to go, oh, yeah, no, that's Sandy. She talks about this. And, and you know, like, yeah, I really like her. And, and she's got this little free preview that I can look and, oh, okay, I see what she's doing there. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll go buy her course. Yeah, so it all kinds of builds up. So just before I hand over to Beverly, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just ask if you've got any specific questions that I can answer for you uh, around those. And, and like I said, the, the whole kind of concept of this is back to basics. So it's it's kind of just reiterating the, the main key things. But please do ask any questions that you might have. So, Nikki, thank you for that. Uh, I have a question. So, um why would anybody want to come on my live facilitation when they can buy a, an online course? Now, the aim of the live facilitation is then I can sell them some other stuff like my executive coaching. And, you know, there's other things that I'm, I'm going to want them to purchase once they go on this uh, program. So, but, you know, if they go on this online course and then they learn the tools and techniques, then why would they want to come and do a live it, it's, it is a good question. And the reason is they're getting personal access to you. Okay. Because when people go through an online course, they will interpret uh, the content in a, in a very specific way. Okay. But who have they got to ask questions yes. of? Even if you've got a Facebook group where they can go in and type, it's not the same as having personal access to the expert where you know, we can get together as a group. So that's, that's the main selling point for doing things live. It's personal access to the expert. Um, and also it's about, if, if you're going to do stuff in, in groups, is having access to other like-minded people yeah. where you can share experiences. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for me? Yeah, sorry, I've got one. So obviously, as you know, I'm not thinking about online course at the moment, but yeah. I do a lot of Zoom meetings and I'm doing webinars and I'm doing so much. And I'm just wondering whether it's worth me investing in that flat light that you talked about. I have my, I love my camera. That yeah. was from your recommendation. And I was very hesitant because I, was like, I hope it's not complicated and it was really easy. And if I can do it, can do it. and it's really, really, it's a really good camera. Um, but if you would recommend that, yeah, Chris, just invest in that light. I've got a ring light yeah. uh, that because I'm also a yoga teacher and guess what? I'm useless. So I struggle functioning it and it's been sitting behind me for like 
four months and literally useless with a capital U. So um, if you think that actually the flat light is worth, because I like the way that you showed it on your screen that it just hangs on your laptop, I think. Uh, yeah, so I, I would definitely recommend, I mean, the, the flat light itself was, I'm going to say 40 pounds. Yes, it's Amazon. not that expensive, yeah. Yeah, you need a tripod to go with it because it doesn't come with a tripod. But yeah, all I literally have it done is it sits at the back of the monitor uh, right. just above where the webcam is. Okay. Um, and yes, I would definitely recommend it. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. One last go. It's like an auction. Going, going. Any more questions? Sorry, I have one more question. So, okay. um, I, because I have like the money hat on, you know, sort of commercially then, yeah. sort of the amount of investment that we would need to make, obviously as individuals, depending on the size of the course, right? But how much of, like, I guess, I don't know if I'm answer, asking this in a, in a correct way so that it's easy for you to get, understand, but um, what's the success rate of anybody wanting to buy my course if you know what I mean like can you give us examples I think Beverly you were talking about it initially that you've got so many you know so much growth but because I just think like resilience is a topic that is so personal that I'm not entirely convinced that people would want to but I think they would want some hand holding is what I'm gravitating towards so if you can sort of share that we've had some success with x these are some of the courses that they've, and these are the number of people that are signing up. And this is the kind of revenue we could see. I know that's very specific, but if you can give an example like that, then I would really welcome that. Okay, so um, shall I just talk about uh, hosting and marketing then, Nikki? Um, and I'll, I'll answer that question, Chris, um, as we're sort of going along. So um, it, it, all, it all falls down to this push and pull marketing. So push marketing is anything that you put out there. Renfield was talking about his uh, marketing that he's doing this week on social media. You know, all the posts that I do, I'm very active on social media, as you know, that's all push marketing. That is just awareness, your brand and everything else. And then coming back in is your pull marketing is where you actually get your clients from. And it doesn't just happen if people go, oh, my business is two years old and I've still got no business, you know, and because you're constantly doing that, that push marketing. When you start to do your pull marketing, you've got to be thinking about a funnel, where that's going to come from, um, you know, how you're going to do that. And I see a lot of people giving their intellectual property away for free um, instead of maybe attaching it to a lead generation um, program. Um, I think I spoke to Renford about that quite recently as well. So if you've got a, like a 10 point plan for your resilience course, you might say 10 points to get your resilience in your team, right? That type of thing. And have it as a lead generation on, on uh, MailChimp or whatever you use to collate your information. And then make sure that you send out your, um, your, uh, your program or your 10 points to people. And then you start to create a database. And that database is, you, you, you just say on it, it's an opt-in opt database, unless they want to subscribe and subscribe at any time. So that whole pull marketing is, a, is what we call the sales funnel, yeah? So you've got to get a whole bunch of stuff going in the top to go feed out, some little bit dribble out, you know, that type of thing. And then, then at the bottom, you will get your clients. So the most successful, if I'm honest, uh, courses that we have are ones that have been actually um, given from... Um, given from um, webinars so when people have actually discussed the program and at the end of it they've given the opportunity of a one-to-one -one, um, or somebody that might like to go on to a call with somebody and then they give them a discount for their particular course excuse me <clears throat> so this pull marketing is is basically what I wanted to talk about Chris because it's what people tend not to do Passive income, as Nikki's pointed out, is just one of those things. And I know that the online e-learning marketplace is set, apparently, to be worth about $300 billion um, by 2025. And of course, we'd all like a share of that, wouldn't we, for our camper van or whatever it is we want to buy. Um, so we can create courses, we can create training rooms, we can create academies for you uh, which is what i've been talking to olivia about memberships my own membership is now on the site um which somebody will be signing up to today 
So we sort of take the pain out of everything that you want to do for your marketing, uh, you know, for your course creating, and then help you to do to do that marketing. So um, we sort of take you on this handhold journey. Um, and, uh, and Nikki's pointed out as well, the no like trust. And you gain the no like trust by showing people who you are. So for you, that's getting online, you know, your absolute passion, Krish, for what you do. You know, Sandy, we're talking to Sandy. Uh, Sandy's, I've come up with a great idea for Sandy. Actually, she's called Marshall. So um, I talked to her about uh, annual MOTs. <laughs> and a, a toolbox of information so that she's all created everything around the, the Marshall thing. And, and as it happens, her background is in transport, so it's perfect. So she's created this no like trust um, profile for her business, if you like, out of her experience. So it's all about, you know, getting people to, uh, to do that. So I can say, come along to one of my business clinics. It's great, you know, and I've got this business pioneer program. They go, yeah, we've heard it all before. But when people actually sit down and talk to you and they know what your experience is and how you can help, which is what we were talking about last night at the um, at the entrepreneurs uh, session at uh, the university, is um, that's when people get to know who you are and, uh, and how they can, um, you know, sort of um, gain access to your to your headspace. <clears throat> so. Um, couple of things that I picked up on when Nikki was talking. Can I just share my screen? And this is where it all goes terribly wrong, isn't it, Nikki? Is uh, actually when I'm trying to find something. So I'm going to say, can everybody see this handbook? Yay! <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Right. So um, this, is, uh, this is my handbook or the handbook that we created for our course creators. And what we do when we take people into um, hosting and marketing is we put you onto a program of events, which I'll just come on to at the moment. But because we're talking about marketing, I'll do it this way around and I'll keep try and keep it as brief as possible. So this is my intellectual property. This is my experience of creating and marketing courses. OK, so in my book, if you like, in my handbook, I've got these like 15 key points here for marketing your courses and where you can do that and the interest that you're going to get from it. Now, if you're marketing your course to 60 year old people because it's for retirement, I don't expect you'll be wanting to put it on TikTok as a video because they ain't going to watch it. But if you're talking to it and, your, and your audience is um, 25 to 30 year olds, you know, uh, the millennial group, uh, people up to 45, they might actually stream, you know, they might actually go through that process. So we need to make sure through your marketing plan, which is what I do in mentoring, is to make sure that your marketing is going out to the right people in the right way on the right media. So um, I give guidelines of what you can do. And a simple way to do that to start with is to put the URL for your course onto your email address so that people go, oh, I wonder what that is. And they just click on it and have a look and they're straight on your course. Um, and uh, of course, the, the the reverse marketing, which I like, is to put your uh, is to put the course on maybe onto your website, or if you're um, if you want to, you can put it onto our virtual office, which we now have. Um, and what you do is you put it there, and then you use that URL on your marketing, because if people click on that, they're going straight to your website, and that's where you want people. Okay, so you want people, you want to drive that traffic, which is what we were saying that pull marketing and pull marketing is done in a reverse way so you don't you know if you've got a youtube video let's say you put your youtube video on social media people will watch it if you put the youtube link on your website and put the url of that page onto your marketing you will drive people to your website okay and your marketing that way so happy to talk about that just as a couple of ideas so as I'm just scrolling down here, you can add your course to your website. You can have a dedicated page. So let's say you're Olivia and you've got your brand new magazine um, and you've got about me, about Olivia, what I do, courses. And then you click on that and you've got brand new academy and that goes straight over to us. OK, so that's where we're hosting that information. It's as simple as that. We just build that page onto your website. Uh, I've written in this handbook a social media guide which talks about all the different types of media <clears throat> that you can use. We give everybody um, that comes on to the um, hosting and marketing their own advert, which you can see there, two of Nikki's on a Lego. One that's like a course card. This is 
all the groups, stories, everything else, all the different social medias that we use um, and what you actually can do uh, with it. So example, you can put the URL for your code into LinkedIn, but you can't put it onto Instagram because Instagram doesn't pick up URLs. So what you would have to do is to make a link tree in the bio and put your course content into the link tree and then it would go straight over to your website. So we are here to help you with your uh, marketing. And as we say, our commitment to you is very much um, helping you to get that um, information across all the different social media platforms to give you the, the best the best spread, if you like, of um, um, of support for marketing. So when people come into our hosting and marketing, because sometimes they create a course and want to put it somewhere else, which is absolutely fine through Course Creators um, Academy, but we are one of the most reasonably priced platforms. Um, having done our research, you've got Udemy that charge fifty percent. Uh, you know, you've got Skillshare and other people as well, and um, um, and lots of discounts. So I'm just going to stop sharing that just for a moment <clears throat> um, and just pick up this um, graphic that we've made. So when we take people into the um, hosting and marketing program with your course, when you've de designed it, developed it, and it's all looking fabulous, we can take you into tier one, two, and three, depending on how many courses a year you want to create with us um, and host with us. And a membership platform is our T4, uh, tier four. So if you've got five courses, it's £30 per month to do that. That's to administrate, to certificate, and all the other things that we do um, and administer online. So we're effectively being your outsourced training company, if you like. Um, and it means you simply just don't have to do anything at all as that let us know if there's any changes, any Zoom links you want putting in your courses. Um, and we take all that um, as administration um, through your through your membership. So once you've created your to uh, your um, uh, you've had to look at the tutorial that Nikki's created. Uh, you get your one to one where we start creating your course, validate the idea which Nikki's already spoken to you about, and then you can come on to these types of sessions each month with us and learn something new. Um, and we usually spotlight somebody so they can tell us how well they've been doing or any tips and tricks that they've learned. Um, and of course, as part of being part of the academy, you can come on to the 50 Club Networking, which is once a month um, and, um, and anything else that we're doing uh, that is um, going to help you to create your and, and develop your business. So, um, so Nikki is all about creating and um, I come up with ideas and then put those to Nikki and we share them. Um, and, um, and then Nikki will talk to you and help you to shape up your ideas. Once that's done and your content is created, then we take you into hosting and marketing and support you with Brand Ambassador Handbook. We've also got affiliate programs. You can get your friends to sell your courses um, or your contacts. Um, and uh, uh, we, we, we now have uh, courses on um, Groupon. They asked if they could uh, have some courses from us as well. We're now the UK distributor for a, for a New Zealand company. We've got 250 of their courses. So the academy is growing. And of course, the idea of this, when I set it up, um, and Nikki helped me with that, is to provide a hosted space, which is collaborative. So if they're seeing Nikki, they're seeing you, they're seeing me and they're seeing Renford and everybody else that's on that course. So the library we've put in there now, hopefully will direct people to courses that they might like to see. So um, I could go on forever about this because of course I absolutely love it and it's and it's my business, but you, <laughs> you don't want to hear over that. But so what I will say is that we are here to help you and we'll do our absolute level best to make sure that you've got what you need for your of uh, your course and us hosting that online. So um, I think that's about me, Dan, because I've got about 10 more presentations behind there, but you don't need to see those just yet. Uh, so <laughs> has anybody got any questions that they might like to ask me? Olivia, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, one question. Um, so um, because my, my, my aim is, like I said, is to create the academy, so to invite contributors to create their own courses. Um, if I get the course onto the system. Who does the uh, content belong to? 
Does it belong to, to you guys, to me, to the contributor? How does okay, that work? so it's your academy, so it's your intellectual property. Um, and on our agreement that we have with people, it says about that as well. So everything is agreed up front. So if anybody signs up to one of your courses, they're effectively signing up onto the academy. Um, and what we do is you receive a notification from the platform that somebody has bought one of your courses. When that actually happens, you have to give that person the opportunity of coming onto your database because they signed up to Academy and then we pass them over to you. Um, is it, does that make sense? So it, the, the intellectual property, if it's in your Academy, um, is uh, the intellectual property of your trainers. Let's say if I was having a course under yours, that would be my uh, intellectual property. But we make sure that everybody is, is fully aware of that before uh, we send anybody from Academy over to you. Uh, we have some schools on Academy as well. So we have to make sure that anybody that's under 18 is taken off for GDPR reasons uh, before the end of the month. So we're, you know, we're, we're sort of up to speed to make sure that IP and GDPR is all kept straight. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else have some questions? No? Yes, Renford. Um, as a follow on to that, um, if you've branded your videos anyway, watermarked them. Um, this is a top, hot topic for me, um, but not for today. Um, then your, your IP is protected. Um, uh, it's a very simple thing to do. Uh, uh, and uh, I just wanted to add that because um, it's a very hot topic at the moment because of a copyright theft. Yes. So anybody that's got um, like you've got behind your head at the moment, the trainer explainer, Renford, you know, they, these aren't our courses. We are a hosted platform. We just help you to create them. So you've got Olivia on yours. You will have brand new magazine all over it. It's yours. Um, and, um, and of course, there is this thing, isn't there, called common knowledge, which if you anybody that's done further education, um, higher education will know that common knowledge is uh, how many ways can you say the same thing? And it's how many times can you write the same thing by changing the words around? But you will know if something is your is your co content, if you saw that. Um, I've had this happen to me twice in my career. Um, and uh, once was quite an important piece of work that I'd actually written. So it's always good if, if you're going to do something is to get something trademarked, if it's your, if it's your uh, programme. Um, but if it's your program, you need to make sure that you've got um, some copyright information on there and uh, what you intend to do, um, you know, uh, yourself. So one of our hosted clients actually had their own GDPR policy on their front page. So on their landing page, it actually said about the GDPR policy for them. Anything else? Anything, Chris? Um, no, I think I was really, I was smiling when I was listening to you because I feel like I'm on the right track. So I'm doing a yeah. few of the things that you're sharing. Yeah. And I'm like, because I'm not a marketeer, my background is HR. Yes. And so having this business, you know, I've really kind of, this has been like a huge learning curve for me, you know, social media presence, getting myself out there, creating like a database and running masterclasses and having like them to sign up to my free guide on resilience. So and, and, you know, so some of the things you were saying, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm getting it from the experts. So I think I'm on the right track. Yes. Um, but, you know, I mean, you've done, and Nikki's done a great landing page for me. So, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with, with the way things are going right now. And I also am yeah. preoccupied with another client as well. So I don't want to take too much on and then not be able to deliver. So, mm. you know, but I think I'm going in the right direction. So thank you for that. That's OK. Thank you as well um, for for allowing us to host your work. And then the other sort of final thing here is very much a case of, um, you know, we can create whatever it is that you need to create, really. And uh, the platform is now developed enough to to have that as a really nice stacked up system. So um, we've just um, taken on board a, um, a new client I think we've onboarded about four in the last couple of weeks. Um, and underneath their particular school, which is very much key to Olivia, is they are now hosting somebody else's is, uh, programs. So, um, you know, so we can do that. We've got another corporate client that hosts uh, schools and colleges, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all um, that's all in place. And for like Sandy, we now have one of our clients who's got a, 
a, a, um, a sort of a, a wellness program, uh, but it's it it's it's a different topic than yours. But it's because it's geared up for one particular one of their clients. But uh, what they've done is they've actually uh, highlighted that as different topics underneath one main umbrella. So it's it's all there and it's all ready for us to help you to create your create your information. So um, happy to help with um, marketing and and hosting and codes and freebies and how that all works. Nikki is there to help you with your content creation. Um, and thank you very much, Nikki, for that today. It was great. Um, anything else anybody wants to do? Sorry, just one more question. You know, like uh, the landing page that was created, right, a few weeks ago by, by Nikki. Um, do you have like any stats on how many people are visiting the page or are you able to show? I mean, it's very new right now, you know, but like my launch is going on on the 1st of November and I'm not entirely sure whether, you know, people are going to sign up because, you know, I have been running masterclasses, et cetera. Sorry, there's my dog in the background. I'm so sorry. Um, but um, I guess, yeah, it would be good to know if there's any traffic being driven to that page, if you have yes. any insight. Right, so I'm going to hand that one over to Nikki because I know that Nikki can draw down some information about each course and how many people have actually landed on it. What I was going to say was about your Google Analytics. You must make sure that those are set up for your website because what this will do is if, if your URL is on your website, it will be driving traffic there. So you need to make sure you've got your Google page up, your keywords, your SEO is in place and, uh, and that your Google Analytics is set up so that you can monitor that. So the days that you advertise are the days that you want to see how many people have been landing on your own website. Mm. Okay, I yeah. get it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Andy? Sorry, just quickly, I have to run. I have an 11.30. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, always a pleasure to see you, Beverly. Thanks for all your help, Nikki. No um, and lovely to meet you guys. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Absolutely great. And I'm just going to press off record now. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this morning. Yeah, thank you.